Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Cleveland, Ohio by Hal Becker. How are you doing, Hal? I couldn't be any better. <laughs> oh, not wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, I won't be requesting Hal to stand up during this interview. <laughs> be all done seated. Um, so Hal, if you don't know Hal already, is a nationally known expert on sales, customer service, negotiating. He was number one salesperson at the age of 22 in a sales force of 11,000 at Xerox Corporation, which wasn't an easy thing to achieve for, sh for sure. Oh. And he has mentored and, and trained a lot of people over the years. And he's written a, a number of books. Can I have five minutes of your time? Lip service, get what you want. But his latest book is the ultimate sales book. So Hal, I wanted to understand, so you've written all these other books, you know, you've worked with a lot of people. What was the genesis of the Ultimate Sales Book? The Ultimate Sales Book, is, well, let me just preface it. Whatever sales book you read, there's nothing new. So it's just repackaging information. In fact, I tell people, if you're in a bookstore, you see any of my books, don't buy them. By Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends, Influence People. It's written in 1936. Mm -hmm. So before I even get to the Ultimate Sales Book, because I laugh, because it's doing, supposedly, I've told my publisher, it's doing very well in Korea, South Korea, um, Poland, and Japan, but the U.S. is not doing that well. Mm -hmm. The next book I'm very excited about, because it's not published yet, mm -hmm. but the title is the best title I've ever come up with, ever. It's called Elevator Speeches Are Crap, Take the Escalator. <laughs> oh. Why am I bringing that up? Is even when that book comes out, there's nothing new. Mm -hmm. It's just repackaging of information. So whatever I give you are my opinions or b b fact based on all the other books written in the last 70 or 80 years. So this, the ultimate sales book was, was an experiment. I thought, okay, I'm an idiot. Most salespeople are idiots. So like myself, and we have ADD, we don't like, we can't fill out an expense report, let alone read a book. Mm -hmm. So I thought, why not write a book that's three page chapters and they have a very humorous quiz right afterwards, you know, four, four sentences, you know, four questions, but humorous to see if you retain any of the information. So the, 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 the goal was to put like a book and a workbook together in a very short two hour read. And it covers everything in sales. Again, nothing is new. So it covers, it covers everything from how to cold call, how to use the phone, how to, you know, handle objections, I don't even want to say closing the customer because that's so weak. Mm -hmm. Asking good questions um, and everything else in between. So what do you, um, when you say, okay, uh, so Dale Carnegie, you know, way back when in the 30s, and you say, you know, nothing has has really changed. But have what are what are some of the things that you see or challenges that may be a little bit different today than when, when, you, when, when you started selling? Well, and it's funny, I'm still selling because on the weekends, if everybody – once I have an eight-piece Motown band, and I'm mm -hmm. and we paid, we were booked a year in advance, mm -hmm. and I make sixty-two to a hundred dollars an evening, but I'm the one who's the sales guy getting all the business, and I'm trying to kill myself to make nine dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sales is sales is sales is sales, but what has changed is this mm -hmm. technology. So my opinion, and when I say opinion, that's all it is, because people can differ, you know, disagree with me. Everything's relationships. And from the 1910s to the 1990s, there were two ways to get an appointment. One was this, one was this. Then things changed with the, invent, the uh, invention of the internet and email. Then when 2007, when the iPhone came out and everything along with that social media, just what we're doing here, everything changed, the landscape changed, because now we have a phone knocking on doors, email, voicemail, text. So what's changed is transactions and how to get the appointment. So you have to be well-versed in typing. You've got to be well-versed in texting, using the phone, knocking on doors. And what I'm finding, so to answer your question specifically now, in my opinion, what's changed is we have much shorter attention spans. Mm -hmm. So less is more. you got to get to the point you've got seven, eight, nine, ten seconds and you've got to be well-versed in all areas. Someone in their 20s grew up on technology. Mm -hmm. Someone my age in the 60s grew up through technology. So it's a whole different ballgame. Mm -hmm. um, and along with that, business has become transactional 
like I've never seen before. Before it was relationships, and and who knows where it's going to go. We're in the middle of a hurricane. Nothing mentioned with the hurricane is happening right now, but but with Google and um, uh, Amazon, we don't know where we're going. Yeah. We're just in the middle of it right now. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And actually, if you can if you can learn how to knock on a door with your phone while you're texting on it. <laughs> it's even better. Um, but um, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think we don't know where we're going. But the part you mentioned about relationship, I think, um, and and uh, I'd love to get your opinion on this. I think the idea of relationship was maybe played down a little over the last number of years because people was always oh, all technology and everything. And, yeah, they were sort of saying, oh, you build digital relationships. But I, I think the relationship aspect is definitely coming back to the fore and people are realizing that that at the end of the, end of the day is still the critical piece. I don't think it ever left. I mean, the greatest line I ever heard from a 26-year-old kid, again, that's a kid to me, mm -hmm. he said, hell, this is his line. Emails for information, not communication. I'll give you the perfect example. I'm going to give a plug to this company. If you're a musician or whether you buy a microphone, if you're a speaker, whatever it is, there's Sam Ash, you know, the stores, there's Guitar Center. And they have their online presence as well. And then there's a company that most musicians know called Sweetwater. I have no idea what a Sweetwater is, but I wanted to try them once to order something online. They are so good that they call you three or four times a year, just leaving a voicemail, no upselling. Hey, hi, this is Casey from Sweetwater. Just want to stay in touch, say hi. I needed to place an order this week for a $100 item, a nothing thing. The only people I could think of was placing it through them. And instead of just going online, I called them. Mm -hmm. Because it was just as fast, so wonderful. I, so I could use technology or use the person. And when companies marry the two, now we're in the perfect world. And I don't think companies have figured that out yet. Yeah, I, I, I think you're 100% right, because I think we've all had the same experiences, but sometimes it feels like companies leverage technology to keep us from ever talking to someone, right? We've exactly. been, I, I'll give you a great example, Hal. There was a while back where I had to update a subscription on a site and the site was going through some changes and to do the, they gave you a phone number. When you called the phone number, went through the phone tree, it told you to go to the website. When you went to the website and put in your details, it told you to call the number and you were in just in this insane loop. Yeah. You know, and I just, and if I'm going to buy something online that I want to specific, the first thing I look for is a contact number. Mm -hmm. If they just have a contact form, I, I move on. I want to have a relationship if I need it down the road. And it just shows, you know, companies can, we can talk about service all day long. Do you provide or not? Here, you and I, we've never met until now. Sure. You're, you're, first of all, you texted me early or pinged me early. We started this call early. You and I formed an instant relationship within four seconds. and then, Or you did not form a relationship. That's life. Yeah. And we, but most people don't even take the chance to do that anymore. Yeah. I'd love to ask you, I mean, because interesting that, you know, you – when you were at Xerox, right? Because Xerox was one of the, um, f you know, leading companies when it came to sales. And I don't know if you know, I, I, I ran a company called Hothwaite for a while, which was spin selling, which was Neil Rackham, who actually did a lot of work with Xerox back in the day, right? Um, what are there? Are there some things that you learned at Xerox all those years ago that you have kind of carried through your whole career as real core skills? What's well, funny about who with? I was with. I, who's running the company now um, out of London? Is it? Oh, who's Tony, running it? Uh, Tony it's, Hughes. Yes, I met. We did a seminar together in Athens, Greece, maybe a year ago or so. Mm -hmm. And my opinion again is when I when I went to I'm a screw up. You know, I had a one seven acume in high school. I mean, that's a D plus average. Mm -hmm. The guy across the hall from me, I couldn't get a job, so I wanted to come for Xerox. To Xerox. Ugh, I don't want to sell copiers. I mean, what's lower on the food chain? And I remember going to our training, and I went, whoa. And then we went to our, our training center, which was three weeks, 21 days. And then I was so immersed into this that I decided to do something I've never done in my life. I read a book on sales, and I got hooked. And from that moment on, in these words, I try to tell salespeople, because the only profession I've ever seen that's made up of amateurs. If you want to be treated like a pro, do something. Athletes will do anything they can not to sit on the bench. Salespeople are comfortable on the bench. Mm -hmm. So whether it's reading a book, whether it's whatever. So to answer your question, so from Xerox, 
we went through what's called PSS-1, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. for Professional Selling Skills 1. Yep. PSS-1 yep. became PSS-2, became PSS-3, became Need Satisfaction Selling, became Spin Selling. It's all the same, which is question-based selling. Mm-hmm. Find out about the customer, however you want to do it, to have a conversation. And when you leave, do you know more about them or they know more about you? Mm-hmm. I just gave you eight hours of a sales course. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's right. Just ask questions. That's... Don't close. Don't get fancy. Just stop talking about yourself. I tell people it's a daytime date. If you go on a date and talk about you, the other person is going to sit there and go, oh, what a loser. Mm-hmm. Just walk out finding out about the other person. So do you, and that, and that is something, there's a couple of things I just want to dissect from what you said. Um, number one, there's the point about what you were saying is that a lot of people come into sales and never have any training at all, right? It's one of the few, it's one of the few jobs you can get where you, yeah, you get, and yet there's, yet the, the ones who stand out are the ones who, they don't even wait around for a Xerox to train them. They they invest in themselves, right? But a lot of people don't. So is that one thing that you would really encourage people to do if, they're, if they haven't done it already is invest in your own, in your own training? Absolutely. And, and there's a, uh, Jim Collins wrote a book, Good to Great. And mm-hmm. it was a seller. But there was one line in there that made all the sense. Get the right people on the bus. Mm-hmm. And my opinion, the two most important qualities for a salesperson and you can't train either of them. And there's no specific order to them. Number one is desire. If you don't have desire, you're not going to be great because it's right. skills you have to hustle, whether it's existing customers, whether it's inside sales, outside sales, new business. And number two, and this is the big one, you got to have high empathy where you're truly putting the customer first and not the sale. Can't train either of those. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. most salespeople, when they start to study and learn the science of it, because I don't know about you, I am not going to a self-taught doctor. (laughs) I don't want to be around a self-taught salesperson. Mm -hmm. So when I'm around a real pro that truly puts the customer first and I watch them do that, if I'm in the field or or, or I'm buying something, then I'm sitting there going, this person gets it. Mm -hmm. And I've always liked women salespeople over men. I think they're more empathetic. I think they're more genuine. They're more sincere. They know how to multitask better, right? A lot of people disagree with me, but I'll, I'll hire women all day long over men. Yeah, and no, and I think the the empathy ones an in, is an interesting one because I think a lot of people don't understand what emp- empathy really means, right? And some people think it's because I had this conversation one time with some other people, and they were arguing saying, "Oh, you know, if you get too empathetic, you know, then you might even talk yourself out of a sale or whatever." And I say, and I said, "But empathy, it's not always empathy. Isn't agreeing with somebody? Empathy is understanding and trying to put yourself in their shoes. And sometimes you may have to s- deliver hard truths to somebody, you know. Yeah, and that's what real empathy is, right? Empathy could be walking away saying, "Yes, this isn't right for you." Mm-hmm. Empathy is, and you say, "Talk yourself out of a sale." Great salespeople never listen themselves out of a sale. It should be the opposite. Ninety percent, minimum seventy percent of the time, you shouldn't be talking. Mm-hmm. See, in today's world, even from a long time ago, salespeople think the more they talk, the more endearing they are, the more the customer likes it. It's the opposite. The less you talk, the more the customer talks, and the more then they like you. And you're not there to be liked. You're there to do your. I don't care if I like my doctor when I go in there. My doctor's job is to, to make me well. And if I am well, and I got my annual physical, and I'm eating 80 Twinkies a day, he should say, keep eating Twinkies. <laughs> so I want to be around a doctor of blank in sales. Yeah. So. Uh, and and the other, it's interesting you say about the listening, because that is the part that I think, again, it's a thing that I don't think a lot of people understand. They, they'll understand all day. You can say, you need to ask a good question. Say, yes, obviously. And then you need to listen to the answers. Yes, obviously, I need to listen to the answers. But there's listening and there's listening, right? There's listening and really, um, you know, understanding what they're saying and processing it and maybe asking clarifying questions and validating what you're hearing as opposed to listening, scribbling down something and then thinking, yeah, I I got it. I need to blurt this out now, right? See, reporters are the best salespeople. They're trained for the who, why, what, where, and how's. So this is how simple this is. And I can't believe my friends, I can't, I can't believe I get paid money to teach this stuff. Here's how simple this is. <laughs> and you're going to laugh at this, John. Take any 
reporter, notes in front of them. Take any talk show host from Jimmy Fallon, Johnny Carson. Their questions are on a cue, an index mm -hmm. card. A pilot has a pre-flight. A teacher has a lesson plan. Attorneys have notes or briefs. Um, per, uh, quarterbacks have their plays on their sleeve. Um, I can go on with this list to all professionals. Salespeople walk with a blank legal pad or a brochure. Mm -hmm. So I have to fight. What I mean fight, I mean fight to convince them you have to go on a call with your questions written out and pull them out in front of you. you look, you're looking down a few times, which you're supposed to do, at the questions you're going to be asking me. If you didn't come and prepare with questions, what kind of reporter would you be? Mm -hmm. That's what you're supposed to be doing. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. And it does the most important thing, just what you were talking about. First of all, if you ask the questions, you get the answers. But if it's written down, you now truly get to listen to the customer instead of thinking what you're going to say next. Yeah, I know. And, and, and we have, we have empirical evidence of that. Like when I, as I said, when I ran Hotspot, when we did engagements with companies, one of the leading indicators of success were salespeople who did proper call planning. Says people who winged it, like you said, didn't have as much success. And it's there. I mean, the evidence is there. But yet, how many, if if you took 10 random salespeople off the street and you said, show me your calendar, right? All 10 of them would have customer appointments on them, hopefully, prospects, customers. How many, how many, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many, how many of them you reckon would have 10 or 15, half an hour set aside for planning? Uh I don't know about you. I, would you ever do an interview without having your questions in front of you? No. Well, because it's second nature and you're a pro. Mm -hmm. I would never go on a sales call without my questions or even, I don't care if they're tattooed to my arm, <laughs> but I make salespeople, when I'm on a sales call, I ask salespeople two questions. Number one, what's your goal? Number two, where are your questions? And that's what we teach to, teach to sales managers. Mm -hmm. Where are your questions? You're not going on a call until your questions are written out. I don't care what bullet points, I don't care how you do it it alleviates you from talking all the time. Mm -hmm. And they, they just don't get it because, again, they're self-taught. Pick up a book, become a student, and learn what – and every book says the exact same thing. <laughs> I've never read a sales book that says don't prepare, <laughs> don't be too genuine, don't be honest, don't be sincere. Don't, it's just go work hard, write out questions, and just listen. There you go. Yeah, and I think, and I think, um, Al, as we come towards right. the end, I think the other thing that we're fighting against now is, unfortunately, we've be, we've started to become this very casual, shortcut culture, and I think sometimes these age-old lessons, they just, when when people hear them, they're just like, yeah, yeah, it sounds like a lot of hard work, you know, it's yeah, like I have to do, yeah, and, and but the reality is, if you want to be successful, put in the work, prepare. Well. You probably, like myself, when you fly quite a bit, mm -hmm. I laugh. The pilot, probably on that same plane, is doing six to eight takeoff and landings a day on the exact same plane. Mm -hmm. And every time they do that, they do a physical inspection of the same plane, pull out their information, and do a pre-flight because they're prepared. That doctor's got that list of questions on the physical, and they do two, three, four a day. I don't see a doctor walking out going, forgot the heart thing. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I still have this valve in my hand. What was I supposed to do with this? <laughs> this stuff is so simple to do. There are no shortcuts. The shortcuts, oh, take, take them on the paperwork. Don't do your expense report. Yeah. Fine. You won't get paid. But don't make a shortcut on a sales call. You've got an average of an hour and 20 minutes a day. That's it for an average outside your salesperson to be in front of customers. And you're going to take a shortcut? Mm-hmm. I don't know about you. We all love money. That's why you're in sales. Sure. Make the most of it. <laughs> exactly. Listen, Hal, this has been great. Um, listen, um, when does your new book come out? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Two years. Uh, I'm not even sure. I don't know. Well, I'm I'm hoping this one takes off in North Korea as well oh, as South Korea. This new one, I can't wait to. Yeah. I can't wait for this to come out because uh, if the publisher does a great job, it it should sell here because of the ADD. Yeah, no, I think that's great. But like I said, I hope it penetrates North yeah, Korea thanks. too this time, and uh, you know, you can have the whole peninsula. <laughs> well, we need a bookstore so people can buy it. You know? <laughs> I know. Um, listen, before we go, Hal, how can people find out more about you? Uh, HalBecker.com. Or if you really want to have fun, backtracks, B A C K T R A X X band. <laughs> and do you, and where do you, where do you play? Just around the uh... Cleveland area. I live in a suburb of Cleveland, but 
you know, we're booked every weekend pretty much. Excellent. Yeah, I've got to check you out sometime. Listen, Hal, this has been great. Thank you very much. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline, a CRM. See you all again soon. Thanks. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.